If anyone thinks that Hamas and their Iranian funders would stop at Israel and say, that's it, that's all we want to do, they don't understand what's behind this, and it is spiritual. What are some of the effects of the Hamas attacks on the Israeli communities on October 7th? We need to show up for those in need, and Israel needs us, given the events of the past few months. Evil prevails when good men do nothing. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today, from a recent delegation that Joel led to Israel, we present insights and conversations with Joel and Ken Blackwell and Mike Huckabee and their reactions to the events of October 7th that have actually inspired hope in them. Let's take a listen. We're back down on Israel's southern border uh, with the Gaza Strip as the war rages on. And the reason we're here in this particular kibbutz community right along uh, the border uh, of Gaza, because this is one of the 22 Israeli communities that were invaded uh, and attacked by Hamas mercilessly on October 7th. Uh, we have, you know, 1,200 Israeli Jews murdered in one day, uh, the worst slaughter of Jews in a single day since the Holocaust. And uh, world leaders have come here. I've been reporting, as you know, on uh, the visits of Boris Johnson, the former prime minister of the UK, uh, former prime minister uh, Scott Morrison, of course, President uh, Biden uh, came not here, but, uh, but of course to Israel during the war. Lots of world leaders, foreign ministers, uh, others. But we wanted to bring a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders uh, because, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, Woody Allen in this case, and not the Bible just for a moment, if you'll excuse me. Uh, Woody Allen used to say 90% of life is just showing up. And I think it's important when evangelical Christians show up, just literally come. For me to ask evangelical Christian leaders to, you know, yes, you've got uh, ministries in the States. Yes, it's Christmas. Yes, you've got family but would you take some time and fly over to Israel and let me walk you through, join up with IDF uh, officials uh, and others to walk through the, the, the site of these atrocities? I did it, but I wasn't sure that Christians could make that time. I mean, they wanted to, but this group uh, really delivered. Uh, they've come to see uh, and to listen. We spent time earlier today, we're gonna show you in a little bit, just sitting down with uh, the families um, who there are family members or hostages in Gaza. Yes, we asked some questions, but it was about listening to them. So many of them, so many Israelis, so many Jews worldwide, but especially here in Israel, feel attacked, not just physically by Hamas or Hezbollah, but they're under attack by the UN, pass, trying to pass resolutions to condemn us. The UN Secretary General condemning us of war crimes. Too much of the media, not all of the media, but too much of the media, uh, listening to Hamas and reporting uh, their propaganda as though it's fact. And Israelis feel not only traumatized and they're grieving and they're angry, but they feel that they're not even being listened to. Their stories aren't even being heard. And I think that's one of the main reasons for me to, to ask Governor Mike Huckabee, a uh, dear friend and sort of a huge friend of Israel, he's been coming here and bringing groups here to Israel for 50 years, ask him to co-lead this delegation of evangelical Christian leaders. Um, the only other one uh, that, ca that came this fall uh, was uh, Reverend uh, Franklin Graham. I'm so glad that he did. Um, but I'm grateful for this group, and uh, you'll be hearing conversations uh, that I have with them, their reactions to this, to the hostages, uh, the hostage families. Uh, but it's important to walk through these blood-stained homes, uh, the, uh, pockmarked with uh, bullet holes, uh, scorched by, uh, by Hamas terrorists who br literally brought their own gasoline tanks from Gaza to set these homes on fire and burn Jews alive. The, there were 40 babies in this community uh, here in Kfar Aza uh, that were slaughtered. Some of them beheaded. One of them burned in an oven. I mean, it's so unimaginable in the worst possible horror movie, except it's real. And there's so much denial out there in the world. Um, and again, Israeli leaders and the people are saying, listen to us, we have something to say. And that's why we came with these leaders to let them see it for themselves so they could go back to their faith communities, evangelical communities all throughout the United States and even their voices, they have platforms, many of them, including obviously Mike Huckabee here on TVN, but others, radio, television, uh, in print, uh, online, podcasts, to get the story out because there are still hostages being held, there's still a war to be won, 
And there are so many people saying it didn't really happen. It's not really such a big deal. It's really Israel's fault. It's so disgusting, so revolting, uh, so evil that we're going to just continue to uh, cover this story uh, from many possible angles. And um, that's why we've come back to this particular community. And uh, you'll be hearing as we walk through here the booms. Uh, those are not attacks by Hamas. In this case, uh, this is the booms of Israeli artillery and mortar shells raining down on terror positions in uh, the Gaza Strip. Let's continue walking through um, the site of these horrific, ghastly, barbaric atrocities. Ken, you were an ambassador for the United States to the UN Human Rights Council, and you were gracious enough to come on this trip uh, with evangelical leaders to just come and see what's going on in this war that Israel's facing. Your reactions of just walking through this level of devastation, meeting with hostage families, I'm just curious what's your take? Joel, this, this visit has underscored something that we've learned throughout human history, that evil will prevail if good people uh, do, do nothing. Uh, I have worked within the United Nations and the multilateral uh, world that it represents, uh, but I, I'll tell you this. Um, many times, people who were on the jury in, at the UN should have been in the dock, and that is what I know now, that we can't sit on the sidelines and wait for people to and nations to react to this savagery, to this attack on the sovereignty of and the people of Israel. We have a solidarity and a bond, uh, and we, in fact, must speak out. You know, Israel has biblical meaning to me on a personal, on a personal level. Uh, and as I've said throughout this trip, you can't sit here and witness this sort of attack against humanity and, and, and stay on the sidelines. And yet, uh, the UN, where you serve, uh, keeps trying or passing resolutions where the vast majority of the world is condemning Israel and not even mentioning Hamas in these resolutions. I mean, I, many Israelis feel like the world is against them, against us, uh, even though we were the ones attacked. You're right. And, and that's why, you know, back in the 90s, when we, in fact, we, we spoke out against the uh, resolution that Zionism is racism, we won. We didn't win by giving up. We kept, kept fighting. I'm concerned that there is not enough fight in the dog now in the U.S. Uh, to stand up to these bullies and these malcontents uh, at the U.N. But we can't wait. We must encourage President Biden to use all of our resources to leverage against this sort of evil. And, and, and in the meantime, we'll try, while we're doing good, we'll try to bring the rest of the world along. But we can't wait. Biden has done some good things. He came here during a rocket war nobody else had. Um, you know, he's provided a lot of weaponry. Uh, he has provided some vetoes at the UN, but, um, but he seems uh, schizophrenic. He seems to be willing to arm, or not arm, but, but give billions and billions and billions of dollars to Iran, where all this terror is coming from. Um, you know, as, as, a, as an evangelical, um, what's your main message to the people of Israel? And what would be your message back to the American people? Uh, it's, it's the same that we, in fact, as people of the Bible, have to stand together against forces of evil at all times. And at this moment in history, when there is an existential threat against the people and the sovereign state of Israel, Americans, Christians, must take a stand. One more question. Um, we got to spend a couple hours with these uh, hostage families uh, earlier today. Uh, one, any of your t own takeaways, impressions of those of those conversations? Well, those conversations were very, very human. It's so easy to, to become very textbook oriented, mm -hmm. you know, very analytical in a theoretical sense. But this put flesh and blood into the the, the impact of this tragedy. Uh, and so, again, speaking with and, and these these members of family, uh, family members of, mm -hmm. of those who are being held hostage or who were uh, victimized by this savagery, uh, I, I, it's, it's been a, 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 a good experience for me because I can see one thing. Our presence here inspires hope, yeah. and that's so, so important because that's what Christ came on this earth to do, is to give us hope and a path. Light in the darkness.
Thank you for coming. Thank you. Our verse of the day today is found in Micah chapter 7, verse 8. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And our prayer requests today are, number one, pray for the people of Israel that they would be encouraged and strengthened to stand against real evil. And secondly, to pray for Israel that more and more people around the world would be willing to stand with her, to give to Israel, and to go to Israel when appropriate. Governor, you've been coming to Israel for 50 years, I believe, and you've brought thousands and thousands of evangelical Christians to come and tour the land. But we're in Israel's darkest hour, at least since 1948. I just love some of your impressions of, uh, as we're walking through Kafar Aza, Mm. Yeah, what was your reaction to all It that? was gut-wrenching to see this uh, once peaceful village where people were living their dreams and their aspirations uh, to be Israeli mm-hmm. and to be Jewish and to live a peaceful life. Mm-hmm. They were bothering no one. And then one day on a peaceful Shabbat, a day that should have been a day of rest and holiness, it turned out to be a day of savage carnage. And many of those people were just viciously and brutally murdered. Uh, young people, older people, babies. It, it, it's indescribable what happened to them. And to see that their lives destroyed with the level of hate that they experienced, the, a hate that made, was made worse by the glee and celebration of the terrorists. This is what I hope people will fully embrace is that Hamas didn't just kill these people, they joyfully killed them. They celebrated it during and afterwards and thought that they were doing a wonderful thing. themselves and broadcast it to the world. Uh, You know, even the Nazis tried to hide some of their atrocities because they knew that they were awful. Mm -hmm. And if the world knew, uh, they would be judged horribly by history. Hamas terrorists wore GoPro cameras on their heads. They videoed with their phones to make sure that everyone could see what they had done. That's a level of barbar, uh, really uh, barbarism that we just don't see. Do you think it, equates to the, I mean, do you think it's satanic? I mean, it, it, I, mean I, I, I struggle not to, not to think yes. that these were demon-possessed people uh, in a way that we, I'm not sure that we've seen, except perhaps with ISIS in our modern era. But, but this was even worse than ISIS. ISIS would usually target a journalist, a soldier. They would target someone that, that they could say, this person is complicit mm-hmm. in uh, telling the wrong story or uh, being our enemy. These were babies. These were elderly Holocaust survivors. These were not people who had done anything to merit being the attention of an attack. And I think it's also very evident that in in the way in which they went about it, it can only be described in spiritual terms. This was not a military attack. It was not a political attack. It was not an economic attack uh, or even geographical. This was, and I think you coined it exactly right, this was demonic. Uh, it was evil, in a level of evil that it's hard to find instances of it that are this intense in all of uh, modern history, to say the least. Yeah. We had this uh, rare opportunity um, as evangelical leaders to sit with three hostage families. Uh, yeah. And some of, the, some of your takeaways from that? Uh, the deep pain and hurt that they have of the uncertainty of their loved ones not having any idea for 75 days, are they alive or are they dead? Will they ever see them again? Also, you you see the resilience, the hope. They have to have that, they can't give that up. But with every passing day, the light grows dimmer for- They said time was running out. And I think between the fact that Hamas has stopped bargaining for the hostages, they want more than the Israeli government can give them. And the Israeli government is in a very difficult position. On one hand, they want the hostages out, We all do. Those are people from 25 countries. They're not just Israelis. And this is what really, I think, needs to be told to the world. 25 different countries are represented among these hostages, including Americans. So we all ought to be. religions and uh, Absolutely. Yeah, this is not all against Jews. Um, Hamas just took these people as bargaining chips. They have no interest in their well-being, none. And any idea to the contrary is just based on no evidence whatsoever. So what I hope we will do is keep our steely resolve to stand with Israel, allow them to prosecute this war as as they 
deem best for not only getting the hostages back, but also for saving their country. And people need to understand, this is not about simply protecting a little piece of real estate over near Gaza. This is about the survival of the nation of Israel. And they won't survive if these Iranian-funded terror groups are allowed to continue. And you can bring them back to the root, but they will simply grow back unless they're uprooted from the very stems. And that's the only thing that will stop this. And then the United States is gonna have to take a strong, hard look um, at what Iran is doing and recognize that this is emanating from Tehran. And we can no longer pretend that they can be our friend. They can't. Anyone who will finance this level of atrocity against other human beings, uh, there is no negotiation. Somebody wins, somebody loses. We need to choose that we win because what happened uh, to these beautiful people will one day happen to Americans because if anyone thinks that Hamas and uh, their Iranian funders would stop at Israel and say, that's it, that's all we wanna do, they don't understand what's behind this and it is spiritual. Iran's leaders say that Israel's only the, only the little Satan, right? The United States is the great <laughs> Satan. I'm really grateful that you were willing um, when I reached out to you, hey, uh, do you have any time right before Christmas <laughs> um, to come and co-lead a delegation with me of evangelical leaders? Um, you have a lot of other things going on in your, life, uh, your lives, you and your wife and everything. Why did you decide to carve out time right before Christmas to come? The intensity of my affection for the land of Israel and its people uh, has been developed over 50 years of coming here dozens and dozens of times. And I, I really believe as a Bible-believing Christian that I have to see Israel in a different light because I believe that God has put his finger on this land, has scoped out and said, this is the boundary. And he did it 3,500 years ago and he hasn't rescinded his promise. Um, as a believer in the scripture, I don't really have a choice. I have to say, that I believe God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. So for me, if you're a person of the book, as I am unapologetically a person who believes the infallible and errant word of the living God, then I find myself uh, inescapably um, saying, I may not agree with everything Israel does politically or uh, maybe you know governmentally, doesn't matter. I believe that the Jewish people um, have a divine right to exist and to live, and they should be able to do it in peace and security. Um, one more question. As we move uh, into 2024, uh, what we're hearing from senior officials here <clears throat> is that, and, and, and from, really from everybody, if we win in the South against Hamas, which nobody really doubts that that's going to happen, yeah. it's, and Israel's made a lot more advances than the media is saying, but how can we live here uh, if Hezbollah is right on our border in the north and is hitting us every single day? What do we do about Hezbollah? And then Iran at 84% enrichment of uranium. Yeah. Um, where do you think this thing is going in 2024? I hope it's not going where it appears to be going, which is an inevitable conflict, not with Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, or the Houthis of Yemen. It's with Iran. I mean, that's, that's the, the mothership. And at some point, we have to quit pretending that we can work with them and give them assets, whether it's oil assets. Mm -hmm. We need to do what was being done, and that is not to bomb them, but to bankrupt them. Bankrupt them into oblivion by the maximum pressure that we were applying to them economically with not only first, but second and third degree sanctions. We, we had- well, What if we're out of time? I mean, at 84%, yeah. you're just so close to the 90% threshold of military grade, fully operational nuclear weapons. Yeah. I mean, I think none of us want war at that level, and yet, mm. would, do you support an Israeli or American first strike if, if, we're, if there's no other option? The way I would say it would be this way. Whatever it takes to prevent Iran from having nuclear weaponry, we must do, because they're just crazy enough to use it. They would use it. And so, how does that uh, play out? What, what does that look like? Uh, I'd rather not venture to say, but I would just say, that we need to put on the table that whatever we must do, and that whatever includes any and everything, we never allow Iran to have nuclear weaponry. We just don't, because to do so, if we sit back and th somehow think that they're gonna be <clears throat> nice guys in the neighborhood, uh, 
we will rue the day we believe that. And there will be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who will die because of that miscalculation. I think 2024 may very well be the, the pivot of history here uh, on, on all of these yeah. issues that we've been praying about, thinking about for so long. And I appreciate so much you coming to Israel and uh, being willing, because when you were willing and able to come, the rest of the delegation um, said yes. So thank you so much. Well, it's been an honor, and I appreciate your many years of friendship and uh, what you're doing here by getting the word out of uh, the goings on on a daily basis here in Israel. Thank you for that. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks. So Well, thank you for listening to this episode about understanding the unique challenges that Israel faces at this moment and what we can do in order to help Israel in one of her darkest moments. If you found this podcast really valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want to talk about something else on this show? Do you have a question you want Joel to answer? Send any comments or questions you might have to podcasts at joshuafund.net. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.